So in our first technical section for this course, we're going to look at an overview or, or a review, I should say, of intra-AS multicast. Because in the case of multicast VPN, we're going to have two main components. We're going to have the customers on the edge of the network, and then we're going to have the service provider in the middle. If the customer's network is not properly configured for multicast, then any of the overlay solutions we're using in the service provider network are not going to matter. Okay, so we need to make sure that, that intra-AS multicast is working. Okay, in intra-AS multicast, we can break this down into three portions. First is going to be PIM in sparse mode. Second is going to be PIM bidirectional or PIM bider. And last is going to be PIM source specific uh, multicast. Okay, the first of these, which is PIM in sparse mode, is going to be, be using an explicit join feature in order for the, fee, uh, for the receivers to receive traffic from the particular senders. Now, this goes back to the original design of PIM where we had two different versions. We had PIM dense mode and we had PIM sparse mode. In PIM dense mode, it would blindly send all of the traffic from the receivers out to the ends of the network and then anyone who didn't want that traffic would prune the, uh, the traffic back and say, hey, I don't have a receiver for this particular group. Okay, end result is that it was a very simple configuration. You just put PIM dense mode on everywhere, but the disadvantage of that is that it's not very efficient with uh, network utilization. So PIM sparse mode was designed to solve this issue where we have the interested receivers that are going to signal an iGMP join and specifically that's going to be with what we call the iGMP report message. Okay, in the iGMP report, generally the receiver is going to be saying, I want traffic for any sender that is sending traffic to this particular group, or what we call a star comma G entry. Now star comma G, the potential issue we run into with this is that when the first hop router uh, attached to the receiver gets that message in, it says, okay, I know that there's a receiver who wants group G, Okay, group G could be like 224, 123, whatever the group address is. But if there's no entry for the sender, how do we know where to receive the traffic uh, from? Okay, the fix for this is we use what's called a rendezvous point. So the, the PIM router that's attached to the receiver takes the iGMP report message in and it changes this to a PIM join towards the central rendezvous point. Okay, now we have the second portion, which is going to be the receiver. Okay, so the receiver, or excuse me, the, uh, uh, the uh, sender. Okay, so now the sender comes on and the first top router connected to the sender says, hey, someone is sending multicast packets. But the problem is currently I don't know who the receivers are. So we have what's called the PIM designated router tells the rendezvous point with a message that we call the register message saying, hey, I have this particular source, I have this particular group, or what we call the S comma G entry. Okay, this entry is reported to the rendezvous point. Rendezvous point now looks to see, is there a match between the group address G that I'm uh, already signaled for that I have a receiver and that I'm now being signaled for that I have a sender. Okay, if this is the case, the rendezvous point itself is going to build the tree back to the sender. So the rendezvous point builds the sh uh, shortest path tree to the sender. Now we have the sending traffic going up to the rendezvous point. Rendezvous point already knows about the receiver, so it continues to forward the traffic on. Now we have an end-to-end -end, uh, tree built. Now, this, uh, an additional logic problem that we could run into here is depending where the rendezvous point is physically in the network, and we'll see this in our particular design, it might not make sense to forward the traffic from the sender to the RP, and then from the RP down to the, uh, the final receiver. Okay, in this case, once the final receiver so the last hop router that is connected to the receiver receives the traffic in, we can do what's called a shortest path tree switchover that could potentially edit the rendezvous point out of uh, the data plane. So depending on what type of, of PIM we're talking, on, we're talking about when we look at regular sparse mode versus bidirectional PIM, in regular sparse mode, we should see that the, the rendezvous point is only being used temporarily for the data plane until we're able to do the control plane switchover and then edit the RP out of the network. Okay, whereas in the case of bidirectional PIM, all traffic goes up to the RP and it goes back down the shared tree towards all of the receivers. This is the case when we have no S comma G entries for bidirectional and we only have uh, star comma G uh, entries. 
So that's going to be the main functional difference, that in bidirectional PIM, the rendezvous point is always in the data plane because we don't use any, any register messages to tell the rendezvous point about the senders. So we simply receive the traffic from the senders, forward them up the shortest path tree to the rendezvous point, and then the rendezvous point is going to forward the traffic back down towards uh, the shared tree. Okay, the reason you would want to use this is because bidirectional PIM is a scaling technique. So when you run into the, the case where you have tons of senders in the network, which is a, uh, a fairly common design in financial networks, so you're both sending and receiving multicast feeds, then it would make sense to switch over to bidirectional PIM from regular PIM sparse mode, because in sparse mode you would have all of those SG entries for each of the individual uh, senders. Okay, the reason practically why you would need to do this is that in practice, the hardware table that is assigned to multicast, or the multicast forwarding information base, is typically much smaller than that of the unicast forwarding information base, meaning that you could have more regular IP routes versus having multicast routes. So you would have to check the data sheets of your individual platform that you're trying to run multicast on, and it's going to tell you how many S, G entries or how many star, G entries. And if you're running up to that limit of too many SGs, then it might make sense to look at uh, running bidirectional PIM. Okay, the last of the three variations we have is PIM in source-specific multicast. Now, in PIM SSM, the main difference here is that the network assumes that the receiver already knows who the sender is. So we have some sort of out-of-band protocol that's running on the receiver, some sort of like directory service, that says these are the list of servers, these are the channels, or these are the multicast groups that they support, and we simply send the join message upstream directly towards the last hop router that is connected towards the sender. Okay, so the, way, the reason we do this is that the, uh, the receiver sends an S, G report message as opposed to just a star, G report message. And again, this is for, uh, uh, as a side note here, this is through IGMP version 3 as opposed to IGMP version 1 or version 2 which could potentially be an issue in your implementation because most platforms run IGMP version 2 by default. So you do have to turn this switch on on the receiving interface towards the uh, receiver uh, to make sure that that message is being uh, processed correctly. So ideally, this would be your preferred implementation because it does eliminate the need for a rendezvous point where the rendezvous point is the meeting place for all of the senders and the receivers simply because the receivers don't yet know what the source address is of the server who is uh, sending the traffic. Uh, 